to include other ways of imagining this nation, not simply as a victim, not simply on the brink of extinction, but also a nation with a long history, with a, a complex organism that it will be very hard to destroy because there's no single head. There's no single territory which you can conquer and eliminate. We're all over the place. We're everywhere. We're here in Istanbul. We're here in Beirut. We're here in Marseille, in Paris, in Fresno, in Glendale, and even in Ann Arbor, Michigan. That's our future. Turks and Armenians share one other thing. We are not loved by our neighbors. We live in neighborhoods, who likes the Turks, the Greeks, the Bulgarians, the Arabs, the Israelis even are having doubts about it, the Armenians, who, Persians maybe, I don't know. Who likes the Armenians, the Georgians? They're yeah, very suspicious. Azerbaijanis, no. Turks, Persians, maybe. Russians are even a little suspicious about those dark people from the Caucasus. We both share a very strange fate. We're isolated in our own homelands. Maybe we, Turks and Armenians, together, thinking new about our shared history, including the greatest tragedies that happened to both of us, can begin to rebuild a world in which we can open up to each other, to universal values, and recreate our own ways, new ways, beyond nationalism, to think about ourselves. Thank you very much. and so on, and it got also some feeling that we understand, I think, better. But many things we still do not understand. So we are going to have a discussion now. We have time uh, till 5.30 in this room. Later on, we are going to move uh, to Sukla, uh, in Nogaritis. Any of you who have time and interest they can come with us, so we'll have some drinks and chance to put further questions uh, to Ron Sunni. But now I'm going to open the discussion. We can ask questions of understanding, but also critical questions and remarks. Who is going to begin? Concept and history. <laughs> Both. You, you feel the questions, yeah. Um, no, thank you. So you had a very uplifting ending, and uh, I feel like I'm going to ask you a very heartless question. <laughs> um, I was wondering, you know, from what you have said, it seems like um, Armenian identity, Armenian diaspora identity, didn't have continuity over generations. It's, you know, because of the political events of the 20th century, it seems like things changed from generation to generation. And it seems to me um, one question to ask, therefore, would be, you know, where the physical sort of um, places of memory, as it were, would be for the Armenian nation. Where, um, say, someone in the next generation of Armenians would want to take his son or daughter to make his son or daughter feel Armenian. Very good question, very good question. Yes, in, uh, you know, sometimes when you give a talk and you, you want to emphasize a certain point, like fragmentation and discontinuity, etc., you miss, of course, that there are the, uh, the elements that must be understood of continuity as well. Particularly, uh, you know, uh, my view is that nothing comes from the blood. Right. But, of course, there are bottom-up uh, ways of creating ideas of ethnicity. Mothers teaching languages, right. talking to their children. What my grandmother told me. My grandmother told me that God speaks Armenian. <laughs> God speaks Armenian, that before the Tower of Babel everyone spoke Armenian, that the language of heaven is Armenian, and, and it, I, you will have, you're all going to have to pass an entrance exam to get in, uh, to speak Armenian, or else, uh, you know, and those are powerful ideas. I found out later that this is even mentioned in Hora Nazi, how an uneducated woman from, that is a 5th century or 8th century source, how an, an uneducated woman from Diabaka, who came to America without high school or anything, knew what was in that oral text, somehow was passed down. I mean, in that written text. 
was passed down orally through the community. People understood these things. So there are things that are shared. There are ideas of self and other, etc. All of which can be quite inchoate. That is, I, I, often, I remember I was looking at some, one of my old talks years ago, 15 years ago. I don't know if I would give that talk today. In which I emphasize that Armenians love their own history, but they don't know a damn thing about it. They really don't know their own history. It's a difficult history to find and to learn. Very discontinuous. It happens in different places. So, but now things are changing because since independence, um, particularly, there is much more Armenian consciousness in the diaspora. Schools are being established. They, people send their kids to these schools. Um, they, they engage in activities, clubs on every campus, etc. And here, too, it seems there's more consciousness about Armenian, about your perhaps hidden Armenian past than there was uh, some time ago. And there are physical places of memory. There are these lieux de mémoire. Uh, is that what that's memory called? Lieux de mémoire? Yeah. yeah. What? Yeah, that, uh, that has been written about in France so much. Uh, they exist in two places. One is in Armenia itself. Armenia is, the little country of Armenia is full of monuments. Not only wonderful churches and ancient sites, but also new monuments to whatever we're proud of. And we're proud of everything. Um, and then there are diaspora monuments. So you will find a statue of Gomidas, the Armenian. Maybe that attitude, Mark, but I, in fact, the, the school like the Manukian school in Detroit has been increasing in number. Uh, and since it's such a good school in the suburbs of Detroit, uh, people, uh, non-Armenians are sending their children there. So I met a Swedish girl who's learning Armenian, a Japanese boy who's learning Armenian, because you have to learn Armenian in that school. So I, I don't know what the actual statistics are, but, but the school, for instance, the uh, uh, Catholic uh, uh, sister school in, in Philadelphia is doing pretty well. So you may have different information than I have. Um, from your talk, I got the idea that it was rather very difficult for the Armenian community in the United States to follow their uh, political agenda during the Cold War. Because Armenian state is inside the Soviet Union, which is the enemy of the United, United States during the Cold War. So can you expand on that debate or discussion on what were the specific difficulties for the Armenians living in the United States and uh, how did the end of the Cold War change the political context and give maybe more opportunities and eliminate some of the difficulties? So could you get into more detail about Cold War effects? Right. OK. If you follow the, uh, the cycles of, of, of um, rapprochement with the Soviet Union, or distance from the Soviet Union, between the United States and the Soviet Union, Armenian political parties and political movements also reflected that. So in the 1930s, there was hostility toward the Soviet Union among, in, in the United States, but many intellectuals were also excited by the Soviet Union, by the building of socialism. There was a kind of left upsurge of interest in the Soviet Union. Ironically, at the very time when the greatest repressions were taking place in the Soviet Union, collectivization, the killing of the Kulaks, the Great Purges, uh, and many of this was denied by Western intellectuals. And in that period, there was an increase of interest in the Soviet Union. Then during World War II, it reached the zenith point. And so many Armenians, uh, left-wing Armenians, neutral Armenians, what they're called Chizok, people who are not polit particularly political, and even to some extent the Dashnak Suchun uh, was favoring the Soviet Union because it was winning, it was fighting the Nazis right? during that period. Now there were also movements, the Dashnaks also some right-wing Dashnaks supported the Nazis, uh, and, and that was a, a small movement then as well. But in general, there was, there was, this was the zenith. And then, when Stalin made this uh, decision, uh, he made two decisions. One, that Armenians could return to Armenia, to Soviet Armenia, and there would be a uh, help for them when they came. And two, that we would then enlarge Armenia and take back Karsan Ardahan. Uh, there was extraordinarily pro-Soviet feeling. I'll give you one instance, incident. A small group of Armenians, leaders, went to the State Department to visit 
the then Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, and to in signal their support for Stalin's position and argue that these were ancient Armenian lands and they ought to be returned. They arrived there and the Secretary of State said, my dear friends, did you not hear the President's speech yesterday? President Truman, the day before, 1947, had made the famous Truman Doctrine speech in which he talked about communist subversion and how we will support Turkey and Greece. And so American policy had, had shifted against their own earlier alliance with the Soviets to open antagonism and containment of the Soviets. And the Armenians fell in the middle. They were finished. They, there was no way they could. And for, so that, had, that left. And then the Dashan Inquisition again became superior. So all of these things happen in that relative vicissitudes, up and down, uh, of American policy. Basically, Armenians were a kind of victim of great power politics, right? And, and never had a kind of independent agency. So, uh, I like that. Ron, thank you very much. This was lovely. Mm -hmm. uh, two comments. Uh, one about, one conceptual about diasporas. Um, Diaspora taken conventionally uh, as, I mean, you have a core country and there is a dispersion. Okay. I don't, I, I, I mean, there is, a, there is a certain reverse or implosion sense in which it becomes very relevant for Turkey too. Mm. Uh, when um, people think about Turkish diasporas to be, uh, today, they normally understand Turkish Kastarbaytar in Europe, uh, you know, and uh, Turkish communities in the United States and so on and so forth. Do they use the word diaspora? No, they don't. Okay. No, they don't. Uh, no, they don't, and I have my own hypothesis about that. Uh, why the word diaspora is not used? Because there is this, uh, I mean, the, the mother countries, the central core areas dominant nationally, refuses to regard them as diasporas. Uh, that is to say because the atavistic pull is too strong. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is a deliberate ideological refraining from using the term diaspora. But that aside, uh, I mean, uh, basically, they are seen as extensions of the Turkish nation who ipso facto have to be loyal to uh, the nation, the national line, etc., whatever that is. But uh, I mean, if you consider the transition from the Ottoman Empire to modern Turkey, there is this huge outer belt of Turkishness or Turkish Muslim communities, which is imploding inwards. And in a sense, the founding elite of the, of the Unionist mm -hmm. embryonic state, embryonic